Tulsi Gabbard recently appeared on The View in what has got to be one of the most frustrating and downright baffling segments I've ever seen from the mainstream media when it comes to their coverage and response to progressives. Because not only were they disrespectful, but they smeared her to her face. And while they did this, anything that she said that was substantive, it went right over their heads. And it really reveals just how ignorant the hosts are. And even someone who isn't usually this bad, like Joy Behar, really disappointed me here. So I'm going to show you the ridiculousness here, but really to grasp just how problematic this entire segment was, I think you really need to get the full context because it starts out with Tulsi Gabbard explaining passionately and eloquently so why she is against war. It's based on her personal experience as an Iraq war veteran. This is what she had to say. Uh, as a soldier, I deployed with our, our brigade combat team from Hawaii. I volunteered to deploy with them to Iraq in 2005, uh, which was the height of, of the conflict there. Mm -hmm. uh, I served in a medical unit where every single day I was confronted with, uh, in a heart-wrenching way, the high human cost of war. Very first thing I did every single morning was go down a list of names of every single American uh, casualty, every single service member who had been injured the day before. And I had to see if any of our uh, brigade soldiers were on that list, make sure they got the care that they needed, or to evacuate them as quickly as possible. But as I went through this list every single day, um, I was struck uh, with the names and the faces of my brothers and sisters who were paying the price uh, for this war. I was struck with their, their families, their loved ones at home. Uh, who were so stressed and so anxious uh, for the well-being of their loved ones. Uh, it is those experiences of understanding and knowing firsthand the cost of war, both on our service members, on our veterans, uh, as well as uh, the cost on the people in the countries where we intervene, uh, as well as the trillions of dollars, our taxpayer dollars that are spent on waging these wars, dollars that are sorely needed, uh, to address the very real urgent needs of, of our families, our communities, our neighbors right here at home. She saw the destruction of war firsthand. She saw how it affects American troops. She saw how it affects citizens in other countries. And that's why she's personally against war. So a follow-up question was asked that I think was probably pretty reasonable. Well, what do you do then if you're against war, but there's also, you know, a humanitarian crisis that the United States could potentially help and maybe save lives. What do you do in that situation? Tulsi again took the time to thoroughly explain why there's really no such thing as a humanitarian war. So should we not get involved when we see atrocities abroad? We have to understand, looking at Iraq, Libya, and Syria, for example, uh, that there are brutal dictators in the world. And unfortunately, there are people who are suffering as a result of that. But in so many examples throughout history, when the United States takes action and intervenes and launches these regime change wars to topple these dictators, the suffering of the people in these countries increases. Uh, their lives are made uh, worse off than they were before. There is far more death uh, and destruction. Uh, Libya is a perfect example. Muammar Gaddafi was toppled. Uh, now today we have more uh, terrorist groups in Libya than ever before. We have Libyan people, women and children, being sold in open markets uh, as slaves. So while these wars Which are, we didn't have before when he was which, there. Which I, didn't um, exist before. No? And so so Could while, I interrupt you? Well, let's just, just finish this one, one point, because uh, we feel for the suffering of people in these countries, and we want to be able to help them. And so many of these wars are, are begun and waged from a, a place of humanitarianism. Yeah. But the reality is, and it's a harsh reality, that there, there is more suffering and more loss of life and more destruction as a result of these wars, which does not serve the people in these countries, nor does it serve our interests and our security. You can't possibly word that in a more clear way. But with that being said, after explaining ourselves and explaining how war, just from a practical standpoint, it doesn't do what we want it to do in terms of aiding humanitarian crises around the world, and also because it causes destruction. After she explained it perfectly well, well, then Meghan McCain decided to 
smear her to her face. My understanding is you know how I feel about your stance on foreign policy. And when I hear the name Tulsi Gabbard, I think of a sod apologist. I think of someone who comes back to the United States and is spouting propaganda from Syria. You have said that the Syrian President Assad is not the enemy of the United States, yet he's used chemical weapons against his own people 300 times. That was a red line with President Obama. That's our, that is not our enemy. 13 million Syrians have been displaced. So when you say regime change is hurtful for the country, but gassing children isn't more hurtful, it's hard for me to understand where you come from a humanitarian standpoint if you were to become president. Uh, well, you're putting words in my mouth that I've never said. You did not say that Syrian President Assad is not the enemy of the United States. Say it now, clarify. <laughs> the, the issue here is how can we help alleviate the suffering of people. Just really one moment, is he an enemy of the United States? An enemy of the United States is someone who threatens our safety and our security. There is no disputing the fact that Bashar al-Assad in Syria is a brutal dictator. There is no disputing the fact that he has used chemical weapons and other weapons against his people. There are other terrorist groups in Syria who have used similar chemical weapons and other weapons of terror against the people of Syria. This is, this is an unfortunate thing that wrenches at every one of our hearts. This is not something I'm disputing, nor am I apologizing or defending these actions. My point is that the reality we are facing here is that since the United States started waging a covert regime change war in Syria starting in 2011, the lives of the Syrian people have not been improved. Their well-being has not gotten to a better place. Their suffering has not decreased. It has increased. In addition to the fact that Al-Qaeda is stronger in Syria today than ever before. So not only are we dealing with the fact that this regime change war we've been waging in Syria has not helped the Syrian people. It has made their lives worse off. Bashar it has also, his people it has has also undermined our national security, leaving us in a place where Al-Qaeda is a stronger threat there than they ever have now, been before. Tulsi, Tulsi. And Iran has greater influence in Syria than ever before. Her response to Meghan McCain there was virtually perfect. I don't think I would have changed anything that she said. And also, I don't know that I could have remained as calm after somebody just said that about me. Because Meghan McCain just said, when I think of Tulsi Gabbard, I think of an Assad apologist. Someone who comes back from the United States spouting propaganda from Syria. Let's just put this into context here. Who is Meghan McCain? She is the daughter of a warmonger who has no real talent and only got that job as a host because she was born into a family that is very rich and very powerful. So for you to smear a veteran who is anti-war as an Assad apologist when she just explained to you why she's against regime change wars around the world, including in Syria, that's a different level of of disgusting. That's a level of gaslighting that is so disingenuous, so absurd, that anybody who listens to Meghan McCain should immediately acknowledge that she is a political fraud and she knows nothing about what she's talking about. And what's frustrating is that you say all of this about Tulsi Gabbard after you just heard her, I showed you the clips, make a passionate defense as to why we shouldn't intervene. Yes, Assad may be doing these horrible things to his own citizens and that's bad. There are dictators around the world who are constantly doing horrible things. There is a genocide going on currently in Myanmar against the Rohingya. But if we are going to intervene for humanitarian reasons, then one, we'd have to intervene in pretty much most countries everywhere. And two, we shouldn't because we always exacerbate these crises. So not only would we have to intervene everywhere if we believe that humanitarian wars was actually a thing, but we also shouldn't intervene because we obviously make matters worse. She just explained it. She just explained it to you. She explained why she's against regime change in Syria and Meghan McCain still called her an Assad apologist unbelievable but it's gonna get worse believe it or not because after she just had to reiterate the point that she just made that went over megan mccain's head well then anna navarro is going to chime in and ask her about venezuela and then it's going to end on just a laughable just atrocious note why are you so against uh okay. 
intervention in Venezuela, not military intervention, but what we are doing? Because every time the United States, and particularly in Latin America, has gotten involved in regime change, using different tools to enact that regime change, there have been both short and long-term devastating impacts. If there are ways that we can work with surrounding countries to try to get humanitarian aid into people there, then we should be doing that. But for the United States to go in and choose who should be the leader of Venezuela, that is not something that serves the interests of the Venezuelan people. That's something that they need to determine themselves. But the U.S. is themselves. not choosing who's going to be the leader of Venezuela. It's, you know, it's millions of Venezuelans marching on the streets. Just, and so, just but do by, you put military intervention in the same level that you put economic and uh, diplomatic efforts? The United States has used both military, CIA, sanctions, and other tools to intervene and enact regime change in countries around the world. Uh, Iran is a great example. Uh, the CIA led a covert operation to overthrow uh, the government in Iran decades ago in Mossadegh. This led to decades upon decades of hardship and suffering and authoritarian governments and has led us to the place where we're dealing with many challenges we'll come today. To from Iran. Yeah, we're going to come back with more from you because I think you have more to say on this and you should. Um, I'm just wondering if this particular position that you take is going to be a popular one in the Democratic Party. Uh, this is a position that I have found many Americans appreciate and understand mm -hmm. because we understand that every one of us is paying the price for these regime change wars that are not helping people in these countries and they're counterproductive to yeah. our interests at home. I believe Trump said something similar when he was running, did he not? Am I wrong about that? He I'm may have, curious. but the problem yeah, is not he, that has he's not, doing it. he has not carried through. No. He has gone back and, and has uh, uh, broken his promises. So that segment went completely off the rails. Joy Behar literally just tried to compare Tulsi's pro-peace stance to Donald Trump's faux non-interventionism, and then she also topped it all off by saying, I'm just wondering if this particular position you take is going to be popular in the Democratic Party. You're wondering if Tulsi's pro-peace position is going to resonate with the Democratic Party's base? You're really saying that, Joy? Were you not also with us when we were all screaming about the Iraq war? Why would you say something like that when you know it's not true? There's no way Joy Behar believes this because the Democratic Party's base is vehemently anti-war and Barack Obama got elected in part because we were all vocally opposed to the Iraq war. But now you're going to say, well, is this really something that's popular yes i think that being anti-war it's going to be pretty fucking popular among the democratic party's base joy what are you saying who are you where's joy bring back the old joy because this is not the joy behar that we all know and love who was anti-war who was an actual liberal i mean this just goes to show you that when it comes to foreign policy the overton window has shifted drastically to the right in this party. And yes, I mean, specifically in this party, the Democratic Party, even if a lot of people like to say, look, they're moving to the left on economic issues because we have people like Kamala Harris and Cory Booker supporting Medicare for all and, um, you know, other things like free college. No, understand that they are moving to the right when it comes to foreign policy. So we're taking a couple steps forward, but more steps back overall. Because if we don't have an anti-war party, then that is devastating not just for the world but for our own interests because we should be using the money that we spend on war to help our own citizens but what we're seeing here is pro-war propaganda at the behest of the military industrial complex either wittingly or unwittingly but joy behar is a very smart person so I think that she knows what she's doing, and I think that she knows that Tulsi's anti-war stance is in fact going to resonate with the Democratic Party's base. But she instead just chooses to smear her and compare her to Donald Trump, who actually is a warmonger, but what you're doing is actually more damaging than that, because if you're saying that Tulsi Gabbard is like Trump because she's pro-peace, well, you're not just smearing Tulsi Gabbard by comparing her to Trump, but you're also giving Donald Trump credit he doesn't deserve, because again, he isn't just someone who is a fake non-interventionist, he's a war criminal. The very first military raid that he greenlit ended in the death of a young girl. So, I was so frustrated and just demoralized after watching this segment. I mean, how disgusting. An Iraq War veteran 
who is telling you, I saw war and what it does firsthand, all of the destruction it causes, and it just goes right over their heads. And then, embarrassingly enough, you have Anna Navarro, who basically, her career exploded because she's an anti-Trump conservative, saying, you know, I actually kind of agree with Trump here when it comes to intervention in Venezuela. Now, I love how she had to clarify and say, no, not military intervention. Intervention is intervention. Military intervention may be worst, but you have to understand that intervention in and of itself, be it sanctions, it's just a step that's necessary for actual military intervention. So, to see Tulsi Gabbard explain in such a perfect way why we should be anti-intervention and pro-peace, and then have them all just completely disregard everything she said there to smear her was disgusting. And I was incredibly frustrated throughout the entirety of this segment. I mean, wow. This is supposed to be, you know, a media that serves as a check on power. And it is doing pro-military industrial complex propaganda. And they're using it against a veteran who's telling you her firsthand experience with war absolutely disgusting. Kudos to Tulsi Gabbard. There's no way I would have remained that calm there as they were smearing me and using obvious warmongering propaganda talking points. Despicable. You could support the Humanist Report at patreon.com slash humanist report. But trust me, I'd have way more supporters on Patreon if that was my podcast. Shit.